black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Going to be speaking to Ronnie, who comes to us from East Texas. And Ronnie grew up in this area, actually, where he encountered Sasquatch. He never knew what it was. Um, And since then, he's actually had a couple sightings, so he's agreed to come on the show. And then I'll also be welcoming Ryan uh, to the show, who comes to us from Battleground, uh, Washington. And uh, Ryan is going to be sharing an encounter he had when he was a child. And I have Woody here in studio with me. How you doing, Wood? Doing well, man. Doing well. It's always great to stop by and say hi every now and then. Yeah, no, thanks so much for stopping by. I want to wish uh, Teresa Cruz happy birthday. Uh, She's one of the admins on the Sasquatch Chronicle page, and she sent me a thing. So happy birthday, Teresa, if you're out there and if you're listening. Uh, What's new with you, Woody? Oh, not too much. Not too much. Just trying to stay busy, trying to stay out of trouble. You know me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, not a whole lot, really. Has it been hotter this year oh, than dude, normal? It's smoking hot right now. I hate to sound like Al Gore. Yeah. No, uh, it's you... smoking hot. Next week's going to be hotter. Smoking hot. Yeah. I know we're supposed to hit triple digits the next week. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm going to find a cave to go lay down in. <laughs> but I know the International Bigfoot Conference is coming up, and Woody and I will be there. If you get a chance, go to the internationalbigfootconference.com. And uh, get your tickets. We will be out there. I'll be uh, destroying Woody in poker Mm -hmm. uh, while we're out there. So if you want to see Woody get beat in poker and beat badly, come on out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, come out for that. I hope you've been practicing, brother. We've been doing some practice. Oh, I've been played the other day. Who was who was the uh, chip leader? Go ahead. Uh, Actually, I think I won that night. Take take your time. (laughs) It's like football. You, you gotta go full. Right. You gotta go full qu- four quarters to win the game. Right. Just because right. you're winning in the second quarter doesn't uh, mean uh, much. All right, everybody. Uh, Wes won poker last time <laughs> we played. That's right. That's right. Oh uh, gosh. Uh, but uh, I'll come back to you, Woody. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Ronnie to the show. Ronnie, thanks for coming on. No problem. Appreciate you having me. And I know you had a couple encounters down there in Texas, uh, East Texas. If you would, kind of talk a little bit about going into this area when you were younger and some of the different things you experienced prior to your sighting, if you would. Well, I started hunting in there uh, when I was about 16 years old. And uh, we were just squirrel hunting. And, and uh, there's a creek creek bottom in there where we hunted, and, and it was... Uh, some beautiful woods, uh, big, huge cypress trees, huge pine trees. I'm, I mean, it, the trees in there haven't been touched at that time. And uh, it was just some beautiful woods down in there. But I always followed the creek because that was pre-GPS uh, days. So I always stayed on the creek so I didn't get lost. I'd be hunting in there, and I'd have things thrown at me and hear a bunch of wrestling that sound like something huge around me but never saw anything you know until later on but uh that went on for i don't know from 77 to about uh 
I don't know, 80, 82, 83, somewhere in there. It, it never unnerved me or scared me anything because I, because I never saw anything. What did you think was going on at the time? I mean, did you think people were down there messing with you? No, no, I wouldn't. At that time, I wasn't really concerned with anybody else being in there messing with me because me and my dad and a, and a buddy of mine were the ones who were the only ones in there. And I wasn't really concerned with that. I'd, I'd be sitting there and something would go flying by me. And I just thought, hey, you know, that fell out of a tree and hit something and went by me. Or, you know, I always blew it off as something, you know, something natural going on. I got you. And so many, a couple of years later, was your was it when you had your first sighting? Well, the first the first sighting I had was like in the early 80s, like 80... About 82, I guess. It's, it's hard to remember exact dates. That's been so long ago. I'm... No, I understand. I understand. Well, walk us into it. Tell us what were you hunting at the time, and or tell us what you were doing, and maybe walk us into that first sighting. Well, I was uh, walking down through there along the creek, and there's pin oak flats to either side of the creek, but the side I was on, there was a lot of pin oak flats. And you could see, you know, you could see a pretty good ways through them. I stopped at one point and looked about 50 yards through there, and I could see something big and dark laying under a pine tree. And it was right where the uh, pin, the the flat, the oak flat stopped, and the pine tree started. And I could see something big, and it just looked big and black laying there. And and uh, so I started walking towards it to see what it was. I thought it was a burnt, you know, where they had been burning out the undergrowth or something, you know, and I started walking towards it. I, I'm moving real slow, maybe five yards, 10 yards at a time. And, and, and then, you know, looking up, looking back at it. When I got within probably 30, 30 yards, it jumped up and took off. Still, I, I still refused at that time to, you know, I was, what, 20, 22, 23 years old? I, I didn't want to think it was anything but maybe a hog or something, you know. Did, but, it, did it get up on two legs and run off? Yes, it did. <laughs> but, you know, your mind can't comprehend that when you <laughs> – you don't want to comprehend it when you're down in there by yourself and, you know, something like that happens. You just, you just can't – you don't want to get scared and run out. No, I understand. And a lot of hunters go through that, that where they try and brush it off and say, well, it, it must have been this or it must have been that. And I kind of understand why people do that. It's a way of protecting ourselves because God knows what this was that you saw. Uh, for the audience, can you kind of describe what you saw pop up and take off? Well, actually, my first thought was I'm looking at a gorilla that's done escape from a zoo somewhere. But I'm in the East Texas woods, and there's no zoos around here. So that kind of, you know, I uh, put that out of my mind for the time being. And uh, I really, after that, I just, I kept on with what I was doing. I blew it off and just kept on, you know, hunting, going through the woods. And I walked right past, I walked over there to where it was. There was no smell. I didn't smell anything, you know, that was uh, out of the ordinary. And, uh looked around the spot right there, just a bunch of mashed down, you know, uh, dead grass underneath the, the little uh, pines that were probably been set maybe, I don't know, six or eight years right there at that edge. Was there any features beyond it kind of looking like a gorilla? Not really. I, uh, it got up and left so quick that I really didn't get a look at the face or anything like that. I knew it it leapt into the, you know, it jumped up and, and flew. I mean, it was like a blink of an eye. It was gone. The, the only thing I remember, it was charcoal. It was gray. And uh, the, the other thing I had, it was gray also. I, that's the only way I can describe it. It was gray. Yeah. No, it reminds me of a guy. I, I talked to him on the phone. Um, and I know the area you're talking about. He's not far from where you're at. And he was walking, um, he was walking through the wood. Well, it's a long story, but um, I know exactly what he was doing. He was cutting across. Imagine like a big U, 
uh, shaped trail, and and you but you got to walk. You know, you know this as well as I do. And in, in Texas, everything wants to kill you. I, I think the snakes are out to get you. I think the gators are out to get you. I think even the flies and mosquitoes are out to get you. Uh, in <laughs> in, yeah. in Texas. Yeah. But anyway, he was cutting across, and there's no way I in the Pacific Northwest I, I would be with him 100. percent I'd be like, let's just cut across here. But being that it's East Texas, and there's you know, I don't know how many poisonous snakes and everything, I would have stayed on the trail. But he cut, he was cutting across, and he walked up on this thing, and he thought it was a bear, which you guys don't really have bears in that general area, but he thought it was a bear laying down, and he got within, I don't even remember how close, he got really close to it. And he said the same thing. He said it jumped. He said in a blink of an eye, he goes, Wes, this thing was laying down like you'd see a person or a gorilla or a monkey laying down. And within a blink of an eye, it had actually popped up on its feet, was looking at him, took off, and it actually turned around and screamed at him after it had actually run about, you know, 20, 30 yards. It turned around to scream at him and then kept going. And he was like, I have no idea what it was. He goes, I don't know if a monkey got loose or... This was the weirdest looking gorilla I've ever seen in my life. But it was fascinating because he walked up on it just like you had walked up on it. And he kind of describes it the same way. He's in a blink of an eye, it's on its feet and it's gone. Uh, and he's like, I don't even know if I would have had reaction time to shoot the thing. Yeah, well, this, this one here did, did not bother to uh, uh, stop, stop and stare at me or, or yell at me or anything. It was just like up and out. Yeah, I find it the the fascinating, the psychology behind it, you know, and most people listening to this might think that was odd. You just kept walking and you'd blow it off. But I hear that a lot from it, especially hunters. Um, and it's not until many years later they stop and kind of think about what they'd actually run into. Um, but tell us about your, your second encounter. When did this happen? The second time I had taken a buddy with me back to the same property and uh, the the uh, gentleman that owned the property had passed away since then, and I didn't know if you know I didn't know if he had sold the property or if uh, you know I, I figured we'd probably be trespassing in there by now you know if somebody else owned the, owned the land or whatnot you know but I knew it was a good place to squirrel hunt and, and a nice place and I knew that after by this time I knew that they were in there okay. And, and so me and, me and him went down in there and pitched camp, set up the tent and chopped some firewood and made some, some dinner and whatnot. We weren't even going to hunt that evening. And uh, that night, uh, I was laying there in the tent and, uh, you know, I was telling myself, you know what, I'd rather, one of these things could, all these years hunting in there, one of these things could have killed me any time it wanted to. And I don't think they're going to do that. And I, I'd rather one of those come through here than a uh, than a one of these humans around here. <laughs> so that night I was laying there and I heard the footsteps come by the tent, and I knew the next morning, you know, it was going to be they were going to be watching. And uh, so I got up. I had a six millimeter uh, rifle. See, this whole time I've been hunting down in there. I've always squirrel hunted. I never deer hunt. I, you know, I don't deer hunt no more. And uh, I had a six millimeter rifle that I threw over my shoulder. I said, well, I'm not going to use this. It's just for, you know, just for in case. So uh, the next morning it was real foggy and uh, got up milling around the camp there and waiting on to get a little bit lighter. And, and uh, <clears throat> I took off walking down the creek the same direction I always went. I came up on an area that goes across the creek, and I said, you know what, I've never been over there. And I was looking over there, and you could see some beautiful woods over there on the other side, and I had never even been over there. So I, I crossed the creek and, and uh, went through a thicket to get to this area, and it was just, I mean, once I busted out of there and it was it was just some beautiful woods. I'm talking prehistoric looking woods, huge pine trees, huge, I mean, pine trees, you can stretch your arms out all the way, wouldn't even get you halfway on them. The cypress trees, all kinds of huge trees over there that hadn't been logged in, I don't know, probably ever. So I got in there, but that, that morning was really strange and 
there's certain parts about it I don't even want to I don't even want to bring that up, but it had you know it was really strange. That morning was strange. I got down in there and I saw a footprint. I was following a game trail and I saw a footprint and a pile of doo-doo, a big one. And um, it didn't it didn't unnerve me. It didn't scare me. I kept going. And then I got to looking. You know, I was looking at the ground this time in there instead of looking up in the trees all the time squirrel hunting, you know. And uh, I got in there. I don't know, probably about a half a mile. Saw the footprint and the pile of doo doo, and uh, and then I saw a thing of smoke like hovering over the game trail, about uh, 30, 35 yards in front of me. And as I got to that smoke hovering, I saw a a little cypress tree. The top of it just shaking. The top of it was just wiggling back and forth. That was another thing that was a little bit strange. And then uh, that where that smoke was, something smelled dead. I'm talking about a dead smell like, you know, like a dead animal had been there for a couple of weeks. And I got off the trail a little bit to see if I could find it, you know, whatever it was was stinking. And I couldn't find anything. There was nothing there. I got to the corner of a thicket and sat down. And I sat there and right about 15 yards on the other side of the thicket where that uh, the top of that little cypress tree was shaking, I sat there and listened to this thing breathe for two hours. I listened to it breathe. I listened to it go like that, like he was tired of me sitting there waiting on him to do something. And uh, the lung capacity was unbelievable. And I knew, I knew right then what it, what it was. And then, uh, I, I didn't know it, but right on the other side of that thicket was the creek. There was a branch of the creek that ran off the main creek and ran up in there. And, uh, I sat there for a couple hours listening to him breathe. I actually sat there and ate an apple. I ate most of it and then threw the rest of it over in there where that noise was coming from. Finally, after about two and a half hours, I got up because... I was, you know, you know how it is when you're sitting in the woods, sitting on the ground, feet getting numb and whatnot. I had to uh, get up and move on. And uh, when I got up and started stomping around in those dead leaves, it jumped into the into the water, the creek that was on the other side of that thicket, and come up on the other side and went about 30 or 40 yards and went, whoa, like that at me. And, uh picked up a stick and hit the side of a tree and uh i was standing there not knowing what to do so i was looking for a stick i was gonna hit the tree back at it you know so the only thing i could find was a dead dead you know dead limbs and stuff around there and i picked it up and tried to hit the tree with it and that was just useless but i stood right there in that spot for another 45 minutes and then i looked down that the way i had came on the game trail, and uh, I saw a head peering at me about 40 yards away behind from a huge behind from behind a huge pine tree. And he was just sitting there peering at me from behind the pine tree, and uh, I was staring at. It. I kept doing little movements, you know, little. I was staring back at him, doing little movements, trying to get it to move, and he wouldn't move. So I said, "I'm going to ease over here to this pine tree to my left and put my gun up and look at it through the scope." Make Darn sure what I'm looking at. But when I got up there and put put the gun up on the tree and looked through the scope, he showed me his teeth. And I, right then I uh, thought, well, that was a bad move, you know. I did see exactly what it was then, and and I got a little bit scared. So I just stood there for a long time, and he got back behind the tree, and I, and I didn't see him for a while. So I said, I'm going to walk back the way I came, you know, I got to go right back by him to get to where I came from. And so I started walking straight towards that tree to, down the trail to get back to where I, you know, get back to camp. And, uh, when I got about straight in front of that tree, when I got about 10 yards from it, I stopped and I just stood there for, I don't know, maybe five minutes or so. 
And then I turned my head, put my head down, and took two steps to my left to head back the way I was going. And uh, when I did, I stopped and I looked up. He took his hand off the tree. He'd been propping himself up with his hand on the tree. He took his hand off the tree, turned around, and walked away from me. And it was like two two strides. It was like gone. You know, I, I saw his whole back. I saw his hand in. saw his legs walking away. And uh, he, he there was another thicket right there. And what, he took two steps and just disappeared behind the, the thicket that was right there. I wanted to ask you, when you were looking through the scope and you saw this thing, what what did the face look like? The face looked like a, it had its head cocked back. It had its head cocked back with its chin out. And when I looked through the scope at it, it showed me its teeth. And all I could really make out was nostrils and, <laughs> and teeth. And, uh, you know, it, it it looked just like, I couldn't, it, it, it looked just like a, what you see pictures of, like a cross between an ape and a human. It kind of, you know, the, the face was dark, too. It wasn't light colored. It was, the face on it was dark skinned. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't tan or anything like that. And that's interesting, the, the, though, but, but the body was kind of a gray color, you said. Yeah, yeah, the hair, the hair on it was gray. Um, it was about seven and a half, seven to seven and a half foot tall, and it was gray. When it walked off, did it walk off like a man? I mean, did it give you the impression, or did it walk off more like an ape? It, no, it walked off like a human. It walked off like a human being, and, and the hair on its ass, though, was hanging down, you know, hanging down to where, you know, the back of the thighs were, and it was kind of flopping, you know, and I could see, I could see, you know, like it had been sitting down in the woods or something, you know, there was particles of, you know, pine straw and stuff in it and the hair on its hind end. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, when it got in the river and it came around, did it did it double back and go behind you? Because you had to Yes, walk. it did. Oh, okay. Yes, it did. It followed me all the way out. It followed me all the way out to, to the camp. And then also, uh, when I was walking out, I was trying to get out of there pretty quick after that because I was a little bit unnerved. I was, you know, on a mission to get out of there at that time. And uh, it followed me all the way out. It flanked me and went across the creek and came around to my left as I was coming, going out of there the way I had came. And it was flanking me over, to, you know, to my left in the woods far enough away where I couldn't see it. But I could hear it. I could sure hear it. Yeah, I bet the memories of that first encounter were coming back when you walked up on that thing and it popped up and then took off running. I would imagine all that was kind of came back you know, a memory to you when you, when you saw this thing, I would imagine anyway. Well, back in, I guess it was when I first realized what was going on was actually before I started reading about things that they do and whatnot. And I, I had gone down this same Creek, uh, not that far as I went that morning, but, and sat down in there squirrel hunting. And I had a pack of, uh, you know, peanut butter crackers on me. And I fed them on top of the stump. I ate a couple of them, and I left the rest of them on the stump there. The next morning, I went back. This was probably 80, I don't know, 84, something like that. I don't know. I went back, I went back to that same spot the next morning, and those crackers were gone. And there were some of those little onion, little onion wildflower things, you know, the white ones that smell like onions? Yeah. Yeah, there were some of those sitting there on the stump. And that's, that's when I started putting two and two together. So you get back to camp. Did you tell any? Did you tell anyone at camp what what just happened? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, my, it was just me and one buddy of mine that was there, and at that time, and uh, you know, I've never, I've actually never told anybody much of this until here recently. You know, when you start getting old, I'm 55 years old. When you start getting old, you start not really giving too much of a damn what people think. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so you start telling people stuff, and then they look at you stupid, and then you just quit, you know? Yeah, I don't know about this one, though. I mean, the area you're talking about um, is pretty notorious, Ronnie, for sightings. I've been to the general region of where you're at. I'm not saying I've been to the specific area of where you had this encounter. 
Uh, but there is a lot that goes on in East Texas. These things are seen, I would say, more in East Texas than in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think they're seen a lot more. I think people experience them a lot more. The only difference between the Pacific Northwest and East Texas is people in the Pacific Northwest will talk about it. People in East Texas, it's very hit and miss. It's almost like you kind of got to get to, and I love the people in Texas. Don't get me wrong. Uh, there's guys I consider family down there, but you almost kind of have to get to know someone and then they kind of have to get a feel for you before they tell you what they've seen. And even then it's kind of like drag, it's like pulling teeth to try and get them to talk. And in the Pacific Northwest, people will just tell you what they're encountered. They'll just tell you they ran into Sasquatch. Uh, but there's a lot that goes on down there. What was your impression of the creature? Do you think it meant you harm or do you think it was just as interested in you as you were of it? What was your overall feeling of this second encounter? I, I, I didn't feel threatened um, in any way and never have uh, the whole time I, I hunted this area. I never felt threatened. Uh, you know, I hear about, you know, East Texas ones are supposed to be more aggressive and, and this kind of stuff, but I never, uh, that never came across to me with any, any of the encounters that I had over the years down there. I never felt threatened. I didn't feel like I was going to be attacked or anything like that. Uh, you know, it just, it seems to me they move away from you more than they'll, you know, let, uh, show themselves or, you know, try to, well, like I said, I did have them messing with me for a lot of years before I knew what was going on, you know, and they, they had an ample opportunity to do something to me if, if they wanted to, you know, and, uh, that's the only thing that kept me, uh, that last episode down there, that's the only thing that kept my mind straight getting out of there was, you know, hey, they could have had me any time they wanted to. Yeah, no, and I understand. And I, and I respect your opinion on that. It's interesting. It reminds me of, um, have you ever heard of Mike Woolley and his encounter? I think his was in Louisiana, uh, where he had pointed his rifle and basically he had pointed his rifle because he was trying to look through the scope because he thought it was a guy in a costume. And the minute he did that, he said this thing just went nuts. It started showing its teeth. It started growling at him. Um, and it almost just like set this thing off. It, the fact that he, how dare you pull your gun and point it at me? That's kind of the impression Mike had. Do you think it's showing its teeth and, and kind of getting antsy on you? Do you think it was a direct result of you pointing the rifle, even though you, obviously you weren't trying to shoot it? You were looking through your scope. But do you think that was a direct re reaction to what you had just done? I think it was, and uh, the fact that it didn't charge me or, or come out from behind the tree and, you know, get aggressive or anything, it just showed me its teeth and then went back behind the tree, you know. I, I That was calming in a way, you know. It, it wasn't happy that I did that, I'll, I'll say that. What do you think that these things are, Ronnie? I mean, you've got a good look at them probably better than most. And you've ex experienced them, even though you didn't realize it was Sasquatch at the time. You've experienced them. What do you think that these things are? What's your own your own personal opinion? My my personal opinion on that is that they are a tribe of people that have been here way longer than we have. That's that's my opinion on it. And if you go into the woods and you respect. You know, if you're not one of those people that go in there, look, you know, shooting everything and trying to kill everything that moves, and you respect their home, and you go in there for what you're in there for, they're not going to bother you. I mean, they may try to run you off. I've had them, I had them break trees. I don't know if that was trying to scare me or what, you know, but it didn't. But they they would break saplings uh, along the trail that I used to get in and out of there. While I was in there, you know, and it, that never really bothered me. But it, it's interesting because you know when a lot, like you mentioned in your first uh, encounter, how it reminded you of an escaped gorilla. And I'm curious, um, and it's a respectful question. I'm not beating you up or calling you out, but at what point do you think it's a it's people? What 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 is it in your mind when you look at this that you go, well, it's got to be an ancient people that have been here longer than we have. Uh, wh what was it that makes you think that? Well, I, I think it's just from things I've read since then, since that time and, um, seeing, seeing the way it walks and the way it moves and, and, uh, you know, 
the the face on it is not totally a hundred percent gorilla. It's it's in between, and the uh, it, it I don't know. It just it walks on two legs, you know. And gorilla is going to run off on all fours, but I don't know. It just uh, things I've read in the past and what I've seen and the experiences I've had with them. You know, they they weren't out to hurt me. They seem to have some kind of you know they want to interact. I guess in in a way. No, I understand. I understand. And I, I thought I'd ask a question to you because a lot of people feel that way. I've talked to people who've seen these things and they'll say it looked very human like in the face. Uh, the rest of the body was covered in hair and, uh, you know, would categorize more in an ape or a, you know, a non human primate like an ape or a chimp or uh, something to that effect. But they'll, they'll, a lot of people see these faces of these things and go, well, it looked very human like. And I think you're right. I think, you know, if it wanted you, it could have had you, it could have killed you. If you've, you've seen the size of them, I mean, it would be nothing to take you out and get rid of you. But it's fascinating, some of the encounters. I know when you, you and I were talking before we went on air, uh, the fishing story. Uh, do you mind telling that? Yeah, there was uh, <clears throat> there was several times that I took a rod and reel down in here with me to fish in this creek. There was a huge bend in this creek where it got real big. And uh, there was a lot of fish in it. There was bass and crappie and catfish and whatnot in this creek. And if I didn't feel like squirrel hunting or whatever, I'd carry me a rod and reel down there to the to the bend in the creek. And uh, I'd sit down there. The levee was real steep, getting down to it, to to an you know to the water level. It was real, you know, like a I don't know, it was probably 10 or 12 feet high up behind you once you got down there, and you couldn't see over into the woods behind you because it was just like almost straight up. And uh, <clears throat> I'd be down in there fishing, and I'd catch a little old bass or something, you know, and, and uh, throw, them, throw them up on the bank back behind me, you know, back up in the woods, up, you know, past the levee. And I would hear a bunch of rustling going on up there behind me, you know, and, at, at, you know, I look in the water, I'd be looking in the water at the reflections, and I never, you know, I never saw any reflection of anything up there behind me in the water uh, getting those fish. But I'd come up, come up out of there to get my fish and go back to camp, and uh, and uh, the fish would be gone. <laughs> and I, 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 I thought that was kind of strange, you know, something big up there was rustling around snatching my fish. But yeah, these things are, are smart, aren't they? I mean, realistically, you're a better meal than a fish. Um, and if it's going to take anything, you would think it would come after you. Although I guess a fish is an easier take than trying to take you down. Uh, but when you hear about encounters, you know, around Texas, some of these more violent encounters, what do you, how do you feel about that? Especially having an encounter where it could have hurt you, but it didn't. Well, uh, just going off of my experiences with them, uh, that's all I can go off of is I think these people are either doing something to intimidate them or doing something to, uh, you know, uh, provoke in some way or another, you know, that's, that's, that's what I think about it. But, you know, I, I, uh, I'm no expert, so that's just my opinion. No, I hear you. And, and I respect it. I mean, I respect your thoughts on it. And it's a thing where we just don't know enough about them. You know, I've had people on who've had very violent encounters, especially down in East Texas. And then I've had people who haven't had violent encounters. It was more or less just kind of interested in what they were doing. And uh, the moment they noticed it, it just kind of got up and left. At what point when you were going back to the camp, did it stop? You said it had followed you out. Was it when you got back to camp or did it back off? as you were coming into camp? It, it backed off as I got closer to the where we had the tent set up. And uh, I don't know if it just stopped following me or if it just, you know, s slowed down cause, because I slowed down or, you know, I don't it It backed off as I got to camp, though. That's not the only time that ever happened to me down in there. I had them flanking me the whole time I was down in there uh, over all those years. I, I would hear them over... I didn't know what was going on at the time, but I'd hear them following me out of there, crashing through the woods, and just with just out of sight, where you couldn't see them. 
And you mentioned uh, one thing I picked up on before you talked about your encounter, that second one. You said some weird things, some strange things were happening that morning. What did you mean by that? Well, that <laughs> that's something I, I really, I haven't told anybody. And, you know, it, it's borderline, you're going to think somebody's Looney Tunes. Uh, try me. Uh, I've heard some very... Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, uh, it's probably not going to shock me. I haven't been shocked yet, uh, I'll say that. And I've heard some very odd things. And I think that when people talk about the odd things, uh, there's a lot of sincerity about it. I, I don't think that people are uh, Looney Tunes or crazy. Sometimes the more crazy or something is, there's an ounce of truth to it. You know what I mean? Um I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a, a crazy one real quick. I got contacted okay. by this guy. He was, well, it's not really Bigfoot related. I guess my I have started this, but he was tormented by demons. And he said, Wes, you ever drive down the road and you see someone who, who looks like they're waving or yelling at someone and there's no one there? He said, nine times out of 10 people will drive right past that person thinking that guy's nuts. Um, but he goes, I'm telling you right now, probably what's going on is they're having demonic, they're being, having problems with demons. And he went through this long story of, of, um, you know, the, hearing these two demons talk in his room and they were talking about him, um, on different occasions, they talked about killing him and he had heard all this and it's a, it's a very, very long story. But the point I'm trying to make is it may not be as crazy as you think. I've talked to a lot of people who've run into aliens. In fact, I have one. Uh, gosh, I wish I could get the lady on the show. Uh, and she has proof of some shocking stuff to, to look at. But I've heard a lot of crazy things. But I don't want to push you. If, if you don't want to go into it, Ronnie, I'll, I'll respect that. Well, I'll tell you about the spider webs. When I got down in that morning, you know the big yellow, we call them banana spiders down here but they build huge webs in the trees in the woods in East Texas. They, uh, in those spider webs, I was seeing twigs stuck in the spider webs in the form of some kind of hieroglyphic, okay? And I'm going to tell you right now, that unnerved the hell out of me. Because I was thinking, man, there's some kind of witch down in here or something, you know? And I almost turned back at that point. When I started seeing that, I almost turned back. I mean, there was little twigs placed in the spot webs, made into some kind of hieroglyphic writing that only, it, it couldn't have blown them in there like that. Now, when, you, that, say, when, that, you, when you say hieroglyphic, what do you mean? Like uh, like triangles and different shapes? Is that what you were saying? <clears throat> yeah, like, <clears throat> kind of like, you know, like Chinese writing or something, you know? That's interesting. I know Scott Carpenter talked about that uh, when I did the uh, the Nephilim Among Us, which is the name of his book. Uh, he had talked about that, and he talked about how they did it with rocks and sticks and different things, and, and he had seen something similar. Um, I know when I had Rich on from Washington State, he talked about that too, uh, them using sticks and rocks and making what appeared to be like you know Egyptian writing or Sumerian writing. Um, and both of those guys didn't know how to place it, but that that's interesting. I'd imagine you would have thought yeah. there was some witchcraft going on down here. That's probably what I would have thought. Yeah, yeah well, that's what I, that's what, that was the first thing that entered my mind, and I was like, hey, I, I, I might need to go on back, you know, but I pressed on. Yeah. Well, and then that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the weirdest stuff. Do you want to go into the weird stuff? Well, there was... There was a fog that morning, and it, and it was like just above the treetop level. And I, as I was sitting down in there for that two and a half, two hours, whatever it was, listening to this thing breathe, and there was a craft of some sort, huge, right above me. And every now and then, I catch a flicker of light, and I couldn't see through the fog. And as the fog started clearing out, I'd catch bits and pieces of it. And I could tell it was huge. It was something I couldn't see from one end to the other of, and that that was that was the uh, that was the height of the strangeness right there. Yeah, that's interesting. What do, in the glimpses you caught of it was it a certain color or uh, was there anything about it? 
it looked it appeared to be moving at a very slow rate, not making any sound whatsoever. And every now and then a light would flicker on it. And that's what caught my attention to begin with whenever it started coming through that fog. I was I was catching a glimpse of that light flickering. And uh it, you know, that that was uh that didn't bother me, you know? That didn't bother me at all. More so as I was listening to uh this thing breathing and making noises about fifteen, ten, fifteen yards away from me. Yeah, I would imagine you're probably looking at this thing as a threat at that time. You know, the thing in the air isn't necessarily a threat. It's just weird. Uh, that's interesting. That's really interesting, actually. Um, and as the fog cleared, did did you ever see it again, or was it just gone? No, I never saw it again. It was gone. once. Uh, the, actually, that day, the fog never even cleared. It stayed foggy that whole day, and it was like right above the treetops. And uh, the, there was... You know, the sun was barely making it through, and it made everything in the woods look orange. You know, it was just a weird weird day altogether. Had you ever seen anything like that before? No, I haven't. That was a, uh, that was a first and a last, I guess. Well, I appreciate you sharing it. You know, like I said on, on previous shows, whenever someone says, hey, I've seen something weird and I don't really want to go into it, the moment they do, I usually get a ton of emails from people that are like, I've seen something very similar, you know, and, and I appreciate you to, you know, sharing that portion of it with me. Uh, make sure well, I haven't told, I haven't told anyone else about that. So, you know, I, like I said, I'm 55 years old and I don't really care what they think now. So, <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's interesting. You mentioned the fog. There's, um, I know when we were doing the uh, renegade podcast with Woody, uh, he had interviewed a guy here in Washington State had, that had seen a craft. Uh, it wasn't a Bigfoot encounter, but it was just a craft. And he had mentioned there was a weird fog around the craft. Um, it was shining different colors he had never seen before. And there was this weird fog that was around the craft when he saw it and ended up just leaving the area. But uh, th- this world's a lot more stranger than people realize. You know, when you work your 9 to 5 and you're in your car and you sit in traffic for two hours and, you know, you do your daily regiment. Um, you get out there in the woods and there's a lot of weird things you can run into. It's like uh, the dog man. Uh, no one ever talked about the dog man 20, 30 years ago. Now everyone's talking about this dog man creature. And I think when you get out there, you can run into more than just Sasquatch. And that's why I always tell people, take a gun with you, take your own self-protection with you, because you never know what you're going to run into. It's not necessarily to go out and blast Sasquatch, but what I'm saying is you just never know. You can run into a cougar that can rip you from limb to limb, too, out there, uh, stuff that's known. And so it's always important to uh, go with protection. But I really appreciate you sharing that, Ronnie. That that was uh, that part's fascinating. Uh, and I know out there in East Texas, people talk about the lights, you know, seeing these orbs flying around. And there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on there in East Texas. Yeah, I've hunted East Texas since I was a kid, and, you know, um, these things didn't, you know, didn't really bother me, or, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on until later on, you know, with the with the Sasquatch situation, but that <clears throat> that, that morning was uh, something to, something I, I'll never forget, and uh, I, I'm really reluctant to tell any, anybody about that, but. No, well, I'm glad you shared it. I really am. I'm really glad that you shared it. Did you give up hunting, or do you still hunt to this day? Yes, I do. And uh, uh, right now I hunt like in mid-East Texas over around Toledo Bend Lake. I haven't really had any strange occurrences happen to me over there. Just a few things I've noticed in the woods, you know, some bent over trees and whatnot I took pictures of, and but that's about it. Nothing... Uh, no sounds, no visuals, or nothing like that. But I still go in the woods. I didn't let it run me out of the woods. Yeah, well, I respect that. Next time I'm down there in East Texas, we'll have to uh, hook up down there. There's a couple areas I could take you to if you want to hear sounds. I'll have to ask the big thicket guys if it's okay if because yeah, it was their area. So just out of respect for them, I'll ask them. But I'm sure there won't be any problems with it. But I could take you to some areas to where – it's a real eye-opener come around 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, 1 to 
I would say three to four o'clock in the morning, it's a real eye opener in some of those areas because these things aren't quiet. And I don't know what else, you know, I think most people, maybe they brush it off and think some apes and some monkeys got loose when they hear it. But uh, it just blows me away. Some of the areas down there in East Texas. Yeah, this, uh, this area I'm talking about is uh, right, right adjacent to the big picket area too. So Back back in the late seventies, early eighties, it was more so wild than it is now. So, yeah, it's starting to grow up out there. It's starting to people are. I, I saw it when I was down there. You know, I could tell areas that were rural at one time. Now they're all people are building homes, and I think that they're squeezing these creatures into smaller and smaller areas. And I think that's what causes a lot of the aggression down there in East Texas. They don't have the room to run around like they do in like the Pacific Northwest. That's my own personal opinion. I could be completely way off on that, but I think that's why there's a lot of aggression down there. Back in the seventies and early eighties, even then, you know, uh, this was only two hours away from Houston. I mean, two hours Northeast of Houston and you were there and you know, actually this place I'm talking about, you could hear when the wind was right, you could hear uh, a high school marching band. They've been getting squeezed out for a long time, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, be safe while you're out there. You know, obviously, even though they haven't harmed you, doesn't necessarily that it means that they won't. You know, always be safe. Always, you never know the creature you're going to run into, what type of mood it's in. Uh, you know, like I had the ambulance driver break down in that general area, um, and their ambulance was attacked for no reason. I mean, I've had some horrific stories down there in East Texas. And I've had stories that, you know, from people that they saw it, they saw them and then they parted ways. There was really no aggression. There was really, so it's kind of hit and miss, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but I really, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, sharing the encounter with us. All right. No problem. Thanks, Ronnie. Hey man, what's up with the uh, demon encounter? That's none of your business. Oh, uh, next up on the show, <laughs> Welcome to Sasquatch Chronicles. <laughs> no, it was a guy who called me. It's a long story. I'll tell you off the air. You know, this is a Bigfoot show. I have a very sensitive audience. So if we go too far outside of Bigfoot, people get upset. But it's a fast, it, It's probably one of the most fascinating things I've ever heard. I'll tell you off the air. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, you, just work the du- you just work the knobs over there. <laughs> I'm practicing my poker skills as, as we speak. <laughs> You're here to look pretty. <laughs> Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. Uh, next, let's go to Ryan. Uh, Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. I appreciate it, Wes. Yeah, no, I appreciate being here. I know your encounter took place uh, in Battleground, Washington. And, you know, the um, it's probably about 20, 25 minutes from where... Uh, Woody and I had our encounter, but I, I know the area well, and I know the time frame of when you had this encounter. It really was out in the country. And for people who don't know, Battleground is, uh, if you're familiar with like Portland, Oregon, it's probably what, Ryan, 20 minutes north of Portland? Yeah, 20 or 30, something around there, yeah. Yeah, right around there. It's a small little town. Uh, but if you would, uh, I still found the encounter interesting. It's, it's uh, one of those encounters to where it reminds me of... Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a guy on who uh, he is his stepdaughter had seen these red eyes looking through the window, and she had the she was able to snap a picture of it. It kind of reminded me a little bit of that. But if you would for the audience, maybe kind of start from the beginning. Tell us uh, what you were doing and and what you ran into. Yeah, so um, well, it was uh, I want to say about fall nineteen eighty nine. Um, it was my my dad and I were working on uh, our house out here that we were building, you know, we'd always lived in rentals before that and stuff. So we were pretty excited to, to finally be getting a house. And so we were working late on the house one night and, um, you know, it's all country out here back then. I think there was only one road through battleground and, uh, it was all, you know, stop signs and stuff like that. It's not like it is now, but yeah, I went outside uh, to get a, a pail of water because we didn't have running water in the house yet. And, um, I was turned around, you know, I was facing the house and I was getting the water and I, I don't know if this is just something that 
naturally happens to people or whatnot, but just maybe like a defense mechanism or something. But the hairs on the back of my neck all of a sudden just stood up. I had that real creepy feeling, you know, like you're being watched. Um, it just overcame my body. And, and I hesitantly turned around to see, you know, why, why I was feeling this. And when I turned around, I was astonished to see these two glowing red eyes looking right at me. And uh, I, I don't know if I screamed or not. Apparently I did because my dad came running, but um, I saw these eyes. They went, they were, it was like if you were crouched down, right? It was a couple of feet off the ground. And it rose up to about eight feet. I watched the, the eyes go straight up and just stand there. And then finally my dad opened the sliding glass door. And uh, he luckily he had a nail gun with him because he was working on trim work. And he started shooting it in that direction. And uh, that's that was it, man. I, I was so scared that uh, I ended up not wanting to go outside, go to the bathroom or anything like that. And uh, it, it was pretty traumatic. So it, I didn't want to go over to that area where I'd seen it. You know, I was the only kid at the time. And so, um, but, you know, it, it just, it was something that spooked me. And it, I didn't know what it was exactly. But after listening to some of the other, like you said, the red eye stories, um, I was just like, gosh, that fits exactly what I saw. You know, they were just glowing. There was no street lights or anything like that. It was false. So there was cloud, you know, so they were just piercing red eyes sticking right out at me so it, I, I don't know if um whatever it was if it was just curious you know because we were the only lights in the area if it was something just checking us out or what but it was pretty intense yeah it sounds like it and you know those glowing red eyes you when you turn around you see it um were you able to see an outline or anything like that i i know when we had talked to her you had said it it, it had stood up yeah i couldn't really see a lot i mean i, I could see that there were you know, eyes, obviously, but uh, it, as far as an outline, it was so dark. Like, like I said, this is, we were the only lights in the area. We didn't, I didn't, we didn't have backlights on. We had shop lights running in the house. So I, I wasn't able to, to see a, a, an outline. I could see, because I knew where it was, so I knew it was a couple feet off the ground, but it, I couldn't, couldn't make out an outline by any means. It was just too dark. No, I understand. And when it stood up, how tall did it stand up? I want to say close to, to eight feet tall because the area it was very flat. So it was, um, there's actually a house there now. So it, it's, if I look back to where it was, it, I want to say it went up. So from where it was crouching down, it probably moved up about five feet up with its, you know, with the, the range of its eyes and it, it blinked. You know, I saw that, but it, it it just, I'd say overall, I'd guess about eight feet tall, you know, and this is, you know, as my, being a kid, I'm sure maybe things seem a little bit bigger, but it, it was, I had never seen anything like that. You know, we've had animals and I, you know, I used to live next to a farm. I know what, you know, cows look like, stuff like that. Um, and other animals, and, you know, you get that eye reflection, you know, from animals at night with you have a flashlight or something, but it was, these were just, red eyes yeah and that's a that's a disturbing part you know with sometimes with these encounters the, what people run into uh, i'll ask them do you think it was eye shine and you know i used to be a hard critic of that because i thought there's no way there's nothing on this planet that makes that has glowing red eyes you know there, that i know of that runs around on on the ground and and but you hear a lot of witnesses say that. They'll say, no, it wasn't eye shine. These were glowing red eyes. And I would imagine mm -hmm. that would terrify you, especially at that age. Did the creature vocalize or did it do anything else? No, it, 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 when it was down low, I could see it kind of moved around as it got up. So I saw the eyes, you know, kind of as if you're adjusting, you know, when you're standing upright, you're going to move a little bit side to side. But it, it just... Once it rose up, you know, after I screamed, it, it just turned around and was gone. I didn't see the eyes anymore. So, um, but there were, if there were vocalizations, I didn't get them because I was probably screaming too loud <laughs> to, <laughs> to hear anything, you know. So, yeah, what if, did, and that may have been what spooked them away. I don't know, but yeah, and it is amazing how our brain kind of tells us we're in danger. The hairs going up on the back of your neck and turning around and and seeing this thing, you know, it's um. 
Uh, I would imagine that would terrify you. What What did your dad think it was? Yeah, my dad thinks he, he's the one that thought it was a, a Sasquatch. You know, so it, it was because um, he was a little, you know, he's older. He had heard the tales. He grew up out here, stuff like that. So um, for me, I was just traumatized. I didn't know, you know, what it was, but he uh, it spooked him. And it was, you know, he's kind of when we talked about it afterwards and stuff like that, it, it said that it was probably just one of those check us out or something, you know. So um, yeah, maybe I, he said that so that I wouldn't freak out as much, you know, <laughs> but, uh, or you thinking it was something else, a monster or whatnot. But because I'd, I'd heard Sasquatch stories, you know, and stuff like that around campfire scouts, but uh, never associated it with the glowing red eyes. Yeah, it's hard to say with those glowing red eyes. Like I said, some reports, I'll get that. And then a lot of reports, you don't get any anything uh, with regard mm-hmm. to those glowing red eyes. But, um, uh, you know, Battleground is one of those areas that I love to look at because I'm, I'm not old enough. I'm old enough to remember how how that was out in the country in Battleground. It's not now, but, I mean, back in the day it was. Mm-hmm. But if you look at encounter reports where your encounter took place, as you and I were talking the other day, my bro- brother who passed away actually owned a home right over into that area um, back when I was a kid. And I remember it just there was nothing there. Uh, it was literally out in the middle of nowhere. It was the country. I mean, you're right. Battleground had no lights. It was all stop signs. And I, th- I still think they have 10 cops for every one resident there in Battleground. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it uh uh, it's interesting to look at. If you look at a lot of reports from the 80s, you'll see they're right almost in town. And then if you look at reports today, they're farther north. It's almost like they've moved out just outside of civilization. They're 20 minutes north. You'll find a lot of encounter reports. And so it's it's fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is. And we're right by the, the Gifford National Forest, too. I mean, it don't, doesn't take very long to get there. So if you were a Sasquatch, that would be the place to be you know, to venture back to for safety. That's, that place is huge. Yeah. And that's where Woody and I had our encounter. I'll take you up there sometime. Um, it's, uh, right. yeah, it, it's about 20 minutes North of where you had your encounter. Um, mm-hmm. and it, it's, you're right. I mean, if, if I was a Sasquatch, that were, that's where I would hang out. The water's clear. It's clean. Uh, there's food. There's more than enough food. There's more than enough cover. If I was a Sasquatch, that's where I would hang out. And you're right on the edge of civilization too. It's funny when I I could think of the red eye story. Uh, it's not really relevant to this, but uh, when we were at the Browns property, and I remember we'd walked out into this field, and I don't know if it's the flashlights we were using, but cows actually have red eyes, and I didn't know this. Mm-hmm. And I'd turn on a flashlight, and I I did a quick scan of the field, and I saw about twenty red eyes looking at me, and I I about fell back <laughs> over a log. Uh, everyone with me was like, "You're an idiot," but I about fell back overwards because I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, I was, I was in I was in shock, um, and I can imagine seeing one set of glowing red eyes would be enough to make me want to be done with that area. Yeah, yeah, and then, back to like the cow thing too. I've seen it's it's usually just the pupil on on the cows that you see that that reflection in but these were the like the whole eye i mean if, if i said you know like a an almond shaped eye type you know to where the, the whole thing was illuminated you know and like i said i didn't have a flashlight or anything it was uh it, yeah it's scary <laughs> so but yeah. yeah yeah that's and that's a you know when i was posting that picture about um uh the the girl that took the picture of the red eyes I don't know so much that those that was reflection. It kind of looks like glowing red eyes. I don't know if you saw that picture I put up on the blog. I, I have, yeah, yep. But it kind of looks like re- yeah, it, glowing red eyes, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't really. It, I wouldn't say that was a reflection. Absolutely not. You, you can see the light over on the other side of the glass. That's that's the part that I was like, okay, that's not that's not eye glare, <laughs> you know. So yeah, that's 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 spooky. That's that's what I saw. It's just. It's it startles. I can only imagine her, you know, being younger or whatnot. I mean, and having that right there, looking in your window. What is what's it looking for? You know, what's what's going on? Yeah. Is it just curious or or what? So, well, I appreciate you coming on, Ryan, and and sharing the encounter. It's um, I love to talk to people who are local. I mean, you're only fifteen twenty minutes from me, and um, there is a lot of encounters back in the eighties, back there along that main drag of of battleground. 
Um, and again, for the audience who probably has no clue what we're talking about, but if you look at Portland, Oregon on a map and go about 20 minutes north, that's Battleground. And there, it's notorious for sightings. It's right next to Yakult. It's right next to Woodland, uh, Cougar, you know, all that's within quick driving distance. Um, and there's a ton of reports. And it's interesting, as you see time go by, the reports almost kind of move farther uh, north, you know, out closer to the wilderness. But um, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing it. Yeah, thank you, Wes. I, I appreciate it, uh, getting the chance to to talk to you and to, to share my story. Like I said, I, I, I share it with my Boy Scouts sometimes, but it's good to talk to someone else that you know knows about it and uh, to learn the other things about the sightings out here. That was, that was awesome. I appreciate it. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, <laughs> encounter, I'm like going through puberty here, man. <laughs> yeah, laugh it up. <laughs> Have a good time with it. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, where was I at? <laughs> what are you, what are you, 14 again? Yeah. Anyway, that's the end of the show. Thanks for being here, Rowan. <laughs> Peace out. Yeah. See ya. <laughs>